putting the belt crank in. I want to lay out. I have a pattern made for the top sheeting. I want to cap strip this whole thing off, and that's pretty redundant. We've already done that a few times on tape. And then I'm going to try to get Robert. See, Robert's basically falling asleep over here. Get his plane, get the wing and the body today. Maybe get the tail in. And then we're going to wait to try to get Al Knight over here to do a monocoat demo for us. The world champion of monocoat, Al Knight. All I'm going to do is make up the bottom piece. I'm going to cut out the little hole for the push rod. And basically, then we'll take this out of the jig so we can work on Robert's plane while he's here. Okay, this I've had done all the inside of this with Al Fatic. I want to run off the cap strips and I want to get this off. The, Robert is so impatient. <laughs> what do you think? It's going to take all day to put a wig in a body? Get here early. Then I see. I, well, see, if you were here early all the time, I wouldn't have started this wing. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Life's a bitch. Okay, we well, finally got the wing over in the rack, drying up. Let's see what we can do to get Robert motivated here. Yeah, take the motor out for step one. First thing I want to do. Yeah, this looks like you did a pretty decent job of sanding it. See, now it's always easier to sand it before you put the wing in place. It just makes it a lot easier. How'd you like this little way that this, this little gear came Very out? Nice. nice. Okay, good. Now you probably want to take the landing gear off too. So we'll start right with a fresh body and then let's see when we slide the wing in where it's going to hit, what's going to hit. You're going to definitely want to take these off too. Let's, let's zone a sort these off and just make the flaps come even at the end. It'll just make it easier to do it that way. Now we're just cutting these tips off to make it easier, make it a little bit easier to uh, to put this together today. Uh, phone, phone home, et. Okay, the first thing we got to do is lay out. You got the horn cut. Uh, turn it the other way around. Okay, you got the horn cut. That's fine. And you got the slots all cut for the, yes. the holes, the slots, all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, because we got to get that little piece of tin right. made for that. You got that made? No. Okay, let's make that little piece of tin up to hold that in place. And then we got to be able to slide that in and out when we come over here to work on sliding the wing in, because that's going to be free floating until you get the wing glued in, and then we'll just shove it right in. Things that you did, okay, we, we made this little point. This is going to stay free floating. We're just going to do a test fit, because what I want to do is sight down the two flaps and make sure they line up. You don't have a lot of, a lot of convenience to tweaking these when they're eighth-inch horns. What are you looking for? I don't have my tool with me. I, I have a the little gizmo for opening up the hinge slot since you've got these real tight. Run them in and out of there. Because I have the tool that you made. Yeah, because they're real tight and too tight is definitely going to be a problem here. We want to get all this lined up before we put this in the fuse. So what do you think, Mr. Ken? Is it an airplane yet? I think it's pretty sharp. Yeah, it's coming out nice. There's some bagels upstairs. I guess I even put two sesame bagels. Here. I'll get to those later. You want to see something amazing? Look behind you. Look at Ernie in the fish tank. Ernie! Ernie's! Ernie's Ernie. human again. Ernie, you're so cool. <laughs> Ernie's back to being a straight up and down fish. A real fish. He's good. My prediction was correct. Hey. <laughs> All right, open up the hinge. Don't go crazy now. Don't use a chainsaw there. Just get them that you can... Actually, what you should do is take... So one hinge slides in at a time. And if they're still too tight, you know, just open them up a little bit more. They're off just a little bit, so we want to tweak the horn, obviously, before we put it in a fuselage. Once it's in a fuselage, you can't seat it. It's not even. And you're off by, okay, the outer one needs to go down. Okay, so take the flaps off. Take the horn, just pull the horn out, and we'll put it in a vise and tweak it a little bit. But the idea is, once you do this, it doesn't change every time you wipe the plane off like this, the thinner horns do. Back on, right? Yeah, now just put them back on. We just put that in a vise and, and tweaked it. I want to make sure that's perfectly level before we go on. Up, hold your end up. You got to be able to look right down. Oh, it's perfect. Okay, now you can take it all apart and we can set the wing into the fuselage. 
But first, you got to get that right. If that isn't right, I know. It, it, I've had that it takes before. time to do it this way, but it's always right when you're done. You slide the wing in. You want to notch a little notch up there. I got a little bit more to go, but I want to be able to get that bell crank mount buried right in there. Same thing on the bottom, too. Mark the bottom where we have to. Where that little bell crank mount is going to go. Just drop it. There you go. And it looks like it's it's tight here. If anything, we need to take a little material out of there. Ah, oh, your sister's Judy? Okay, that's the little hard spot, the spot where we want to just sand a little bit away and a little bit back there, wherever it's really touching. We want to be able to float some epoxy right in there. We want to have that whole joint solid. All right. Anything on the other side? Slice just a little bit. And then I want to take, we can do this with the Dremel tool easier. I'll put on a sanding, the little drum, and notch that out. Wherever that line was hitting hard, just take a little bit. Or if you want to sand it out, take one of those, uh, you know, little sanding blocks and sand it out. It's okay if it's big. We want to be able to float it a little bit because I want to get plenty of epoxy in there. Get the fit in there. Now let's check that you have it in pretty good alignment. Take the no, triangle. We don't really have a mark on the back. We've no, but back. check that you got 90 here on both sides, Ken. Okay. And then we'll put a mark on because we're going to have to move it. You're close on 90. All we want is the hinge line. If the hinge line's right, everything else is right. I have to average out the taper here. Okay. And then when you did it, let's get a scribe line on here, just dots, so we know exactly where we got to put epoxy, both sides. I'd say this is about as close as we're going to get with a table. That's good. Much. Yeah, yeah, I'll buy this. Put that at 90 off the table, and we're up. Robert, your wing is up just a little bit, so let's just take a little bit off right down here, just... Yeah, Man, we, about a... We marked it right here. Okay, about oh, a yeah. six... Remember we marked it? It's on the bottom. It's on the bottom. bottom. Take a sixty-fourth off, and you'll have it. Okay. Take it apart. Take about a sixty-fourth off. Okay. Just okay. grind off. Just, I, Robert, I think it's just touching this doubler right here. And that's When that comes off, we should have a real good fit. That 90. Now you should be, each wingtip should be the same off the table. Does it look, Kenny, you want to measure this? Okay. Just get each wingtip. Ah, it looks pretty good. Just measure at each wingtip. You got that at full 90. Need another, another little bit under each tip. I'll just hold that at 90. As long as we know we have enough, so you want to be able to float that in there and get a good joint before we, we were, put any we glue were, on it. Uh, 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 okay. No, no, don't touch that. Okay. Just get 90. That You got it's the other it's side off, 90. It's off again. Okay, get it really close. And then let's scribe the side so we know exactly where this is going to go back once you put the glue on. Close? Yeah, close. But we're going to get this real close. Get it real close. I don't want Robert claiming on a walker fly off that this thing came flying <laughs> in at him have or to something. Put the, uh, the horn in? Not yet. Don't worry about the horn yet. Okay, well. Okay. I just want to get all these linements lined up before we put any glue on this. gives you now you have a decent reference go on the other side too flip it over we'll do the bottom the same way while it's still in pretty decent alignment you don't want to do is just raise a blade that down with a pen just the dots on an ink marker are better
now. Okay, just paint the whole area and slide it right in. Flip it. It's done. Yeah, already. it's already the bottom's already done. And just slide it right into position. Okay. All right. You, you got, got it. it. Go slow now. Go slow. You don't want to go too far, then you're going to make a mess. Go right up so you can see the dots. Now you can check it. Now you got some little variation there. You can get your 90 degree triangle out. And don't worry about the extra epoxy. We're going to bury that in a fillet anyway. Where do I go? Where do I go? 90 degree. Hold that 90 degree and let's just see. Bring it in off the table a little bit. All right, do it there. Now let's Kenny check. Let's see how much you're up off each wing tip. Pro stunt, hold please. This side has to come down just a bit. Hold your 90 degree triangle up there. Okay. Okay, you know you can still float it. Okay, where's my ruler? Half in a line. There. Okay, you hold it and let him pull it down. Okay, there you go. I'll hold it. You get it where you want it. Right there. Hold it right okay, there. I got it. And just check the other side. I gotta come down here. You know, it doesn't take him this long to put the wing in a B29. <laughs> that much. Okay, see? Go ahead. Say one. Two lines. That's exactly where it needs to be. Okay. All right. Now you just got to hold it for five minutes, Robert. Give it five minutes of drying. Yeah, let's go get something. To eat. You're in. <laughs> Take a little alcohol, wipe that. You could you could force that in if you can with the rag. It'll start to kick off real it's soon. It's kicked already. Okay. Let it kick off, and then we'll fill that little gap. Once this is kicked off, Robert's going to try his little method of putting tape along one side of the fuse and then letting the epoxy drip in from the other side to make a real tight fillet. That'll just keep anything from dripping when you when you lay it on the other way. That's how you did the prowler? Yeah. Okay. Use plenty of tape. It doesn't matter. Just get it in that fillet nice and tight. Okay, all you got to do is just peel the tape off now. That's set up. Well, let's recheck it. Make sure we didn't get it get something knocked out of alignment there. Well, peel off the tape and then we'll cut a slot for that horn, Robert. Starting to look like a plane, huh? Yeah, you're okay. I don't care what Kenny says about you. <laughs> Windy. <laughs> don't tell. Come on, it's looking good. I just wiped the edge. Once you get there now. Of course, once you take the tape off, that now that side is sealed, and you can just drop the epoxy in from this side. There's a spot right here. Where? You missed the spot? Thank you. Boy, I'll tell you. How much is he paying you, Ken? Nothing. Zero, nothing. zero, nothing, I'm Nadia, zero. All next I did. I just threaded the horn through, but we need to line it up. Okay, you need to make this crack, this notch, a little bit bigger, see, otherwise it can't go anywhere. So before we glue it in, make this notch come a little bit further forward. Now we just hit that little piece of tin with some CA to hold it in place. Make that notch a little bit bigger. When you say bigger, we're going this way. Yes, yes, so you got some rotation in it. Now what we did, we I'll put a little, do it. The little adjustable joint so we can get a really true neutral. I want to be able, when I'm all done with that soldering joint, heat it just a little bit and add a little down or up until I have the same amount up and down. The other choice, you could bend the push rod and slide it through and all that stuff, that would be fine too. But if you miss, then this is the second choice. And this choice, you have the adjustment. I like having the adjustment. Okay. We'll let Kenny solder a push rod. He set the plane on fire. <laughs>
I think always have a fire extinguisher handy when Kenny does the soldering job. That wasn't my soldering. All right, anybody out there in computer land, we need a new soldering gun for Christmas. Be but we need it now. <laughs> but but <laughs> Christmas comes early. All right, make sure that joint is nice and clean. Okay, now by sighting this, I can see you have just a little more down, a little bit. You got a lot more than that. So what you want to do is shorten this by a little bit. So heat it with the soldering iron, and we'll just shorten it just a little bit. While it's hot, you can just pick up on the horn and force it forward a little bit. See, this is your micro fine adjustment that you don't have when you bend the push rod. Just heat the whole joint. There wasn't really enough room for an eyelet, so we put a little piece of copper tubing. Yeah, get in there and burn a fuselage. You can squeeze that soldering iron and get it down in there. But the idea here is that the push rod faces out, so even if the solder joint breaks, you hope centrifugal force would help hold that out. It was right about at this point last week that the plane caught fire of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the, yeah, you're right. Nah, we're, we're playing. Just kidding, Monzo. <laughs> okay, it's all soldered yeah, up. Yeah, it's cool. Get the uh, defluxing agent. Let's clean that joint up. We can move on. With now make sure, look from the back, make sure you have that, that the solder float around the whole length of the, the uh, piece of tube. And then check that we still have neutral in the controls. We still have the same up and the same down. If not, we can heat that joint and make a little adjustment. No problem. It might be rubbing on that sheeting. Let's see if it's rubbing on the sheeting. You want to get this all freed up. Is it rubbing inside? Yeah, it's rubbing up here is where it's rubbing. You're going to have to open this hole up a little bit more. Right there, Ken. Yeah, okay. All right, just get the exacto. Yeah, Robert's got it. Just, just move this just a little bit further forward, maybe a quarter of an inch, and you'll have it. You don't want it rubbing on anything. That ought to do. And then we'll get in there and get plenty of grease on the controls, because I, I know Rob, it's cheap with the chain grease. You just keep working it. All that chain lube is working its way down in by the bell cranks and the bushings and everything now. Got plenty of chain lube in there. And we haven't spent a dime on fuel yet. Unless it's perfect. Don't worry about it. Hinge line to hinge line. We just got some pins holding this in while we get the alignment. And we'll tack glue it with CA. Make sure it's it's lined up from the front of the plane. Close? Yes. Okay. All right, just take the CA and put... Let's look at it right from the front now. Put your nose right where the spinner is and let's see if it's lined up that way too. You gotta put this side down just a little, just a little bit. We're up. Just yeah, lay that on there. Easier by blocking this up a little bit. Make it solid. Look down. Let's get a consensus of opinions. Now it's now it's too low. Take the move the weight in. Okay, now tack it. Just run a B to C A right down the whole thing. Tack it in place. Well, I'll put two drops on and then we'll look at it again. Yeah, and then measure the hinge lines. Okay. That looks like we got it. I want to see that we didn't move the hinge line either no, by doing this right. There's only two. Yeah, you just tacked on here. So check your hinge line to hinge line it's again. Just moved it. So I'm about to check it. I haven't moved anything while we were measuring. Are you still level? It's now it's high. All right. Well, get it back to where it was. Get it back to where it was before you put the permanent glue on there. Okay. Okay. That looks like I like to do it with the pins. Just let the pins hold it. Okay. Put a little. Put a half a seam of glue on there. Now let's see that it didn't move. Robert, check it from over there and make sure you're satisfied with it. Yeah, this is your plane. Yeah, you got better eyes actually than all of us with all these eyeglasses going on here. Close? Close? Yeah. Okay, when you feel it's close, and just run a bead of glue on it. And then let's check it again before we flip it over and do the bottom, because we can always break it if it's not a solid glue joint. Go from one side to the other. 
Well, then maybe it's time to put a little shim in here. You know, put a little shim. A little Take a little piece of balsa and shim it if you have to. Squeeze it and make it like a little wood shake. It's perfect. You think it's perfect? Perfect. Okay. Ready to sign off on it? Ready to sign? I, Robert Sabatino, swear on the Bible that this thing is gonna, never going to do a bad outside loop. Ever. Ever. Okay, Kenny's filling in that little gap in the back there. You could just dress that off. That'll be fine. Now what we noticed, and this is a good thing to put on a tape, Robert had sanded a few of these out to where he was just sanding one at a time and never got a chance to, to get the real curve in them. And what I was looking for was to look down the whole wing, let's see if we can see this, and they'd all be smooth. Well, there was a couple up here that needed to be replaced. Each one was from sanding one at a time. So it's best to always at least catch a two or three of these with a block, at the minimum of two and hopefully three when you do that, the sand out to get the shape. Not the finish, just the shape, when it's time to do that shape. Always try to have the block on at least two ribs at the, t at the time. Don't be out in midair. That's it. And it's always good if you can go front to back, front to back. And rub your finger right here. You can feel that one's still high. Little high, little high. That one's okay. That one's okay. That one's okay. You want to do it by feel. Most of what you do is by feel, not by eye. It's too easy to trick an eye. Excited. The tape edges for the fillets. I'll mix up some air epoxy and get this rocking and rolling, Robert. Boy, you are in Fat City tonight. This come out real nice. Okay, you got to put some. Put the tape up here. You might have to put the thinner tape, quarter inch. This is a big plane, Robert. Well, this is it's a nice size plane. Yeah, it's a forty size, but it's it's a copy of Wendy's. 60 shift. Only made for 40. Just go slow and easy. We mixed up some of this air epoxy. Two to one by weight. You got a good half an hour to, to get that into position, so. No, you don't have to rush. You, it's, it's not like a panic thing. No, I just... Now, anything that goes over the edge when you're all done... Oh, you got it. Just take the razor. There you go. Well, I think it's easier to use the razor, but if you're happy that way... And you want to get all of that, pick it away so that you're not locking a horn in place either. Okay. Okay, use a little bit of just alcohol in a little cup, dip your finger in a cup. That'll even help wiping that off where it's smeary on the side. Use a little bit of alcohol, take it right off. Boy, you're not a gentle guy. I'm glad you're not handling uh, prenatal babies or something. You got not gonna be an au pair or something today? Look at this. Okay. Now see, when it's dry, it all boils up, so just wet it out a little bit. There you go. You know, all you got left is the flaps. Ask Al if he wants the flaps on or off. Put them on a coat. That'll be one thing. You could wrap the lead outs. You don't need me to do that. You figured that out. And sand, do a lot of sanding. Get it really, because the more you're going to sand that wing, the lighter it's going to get too. No, I think you made out well today. It's good. 
Now, I just got a great picture in the mail today in the middle of doing all this and other nonsense. This is from John Benzig. Coming from these guys, these two guys are going to be in the United States. These are, by the way, the British F2B team as it stands right now. And Paul Winter, we've put some pictures of him on here in the past. Anyway, one of the things they're going to do, they're going to be stopping over at Pro Stun headquarters for a couple of days while they're in the U.S., and they want to go flying with us. Well, guys, no need to bring your own plane. We have planes here. No problem. Anyway, sent a couple of nice pictures. He also sent a picture of the, let's see what it's got on here. F2B winner in Portugal. Uvi Degna, Germany first. John, John Benzig second. Okay, we know who Uvi Degna is. Uvi Degna has that really nice ship built with the Spitfire wing and tail. Anyway, congratulations guys. I'll send them on to Stunt News and hey, we look forward to seeing you in the spring. And by the way, just to go back one, back up one little bit here, uh, Paul Winter is, is in the, as we speak right now, and I'm going to read this right off of the, right off of the letter. Dun, 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 dun. Paul's model is now being sprayed with the tidal wave. He's building a tsunami. A professional job that's costing him lots of money. Bring it to me. We'll, ch we'll do it cheaper. He plans to enter it in our model exhibition Olympia in, a, in London next January. I think it's likely he'll win the gold medal. No problem. You bring it to the United States. We'll get that tsunami wave painted on there. No problem. Paul Winter. Now John Brodak sent me this today to check out. It's a scale warbird template. And by the way, I got the pens back in good shape. This is really something I can use. And believe me, we are going to be using this when we get to do our sea fire, spit fire, whatever we're going to do. Joe and Bob Martens are going to be here to discuss this. I want to get the uh, the number on here. It's made by made by Top Flight, of course. But this really has one of the things that's nice is it has all the rivet lines, the rivet spacings. I was thinking of a couple other things I could do if I want to do Zeus fittings. I could drill these out just one size bigger. It's already got the spacing. It's already got the panels, hatches, gas caps, little things here. Oh. Great, John, thank you very much. This this is something we will definitely be using on our full-scale, full-stunt model when we get to build it. And by the way, Bob Martens, Joe Adamusco are scheduled in for two Saturdays from now. We really look forward to having a, and we'll get some of it on video, a real think tank for this new Seafire Spitfire coming up. Now, I got a little bit of time before Kenny gets here, and I want to tie up his time. And by the way, it looks real promising. He looks like he's got a lead on getting some shop space, so we hope we're going to be starting that project of building Kenny a real shop real soon. Anyway, the next thing I want to do, I know the wing is relatively true. In fact, I did this off camera. I don't know how much truer than that you can make a wing. That, that really worked out well. What I want to do is two things. Before I go lay out the tips, I want to get the radius and the leading edge because that'll set the tip front to back. I also want to do some just r general rough sanding, get all my cap strips evened in, get the trailing edge even, get all the wood around here even. I want to do, in other words, what I want to try to do is get all the detailing done at this time before I actually carve the tips. Now, one of the ways that's real easy to do this, you can take a plane, and what I'm trying to get accomplished here is to get the same amount of the leading edge sheeting shown on both sides of the leading edge square. As soon as I see I'm close, well, one more. Then I can take one cut off each edge. And what this does, it just keeps the sanding dust to a minimum. And I've got a lot of that. I'm showing the same amount of sheeting on both sides now. And what I'm going to do is make myself up a little gauge out of a piece of scrap balsa wood that'll have that reverse curve in it just to see that I don't have one side a lot more radius than the other. Obviously the thing you're trying for here is that they're both real close, symmetrical.
Well, it's handy if you have it as one of these larger, a large, long block. This is one of the few jobs I can't do over by the sanding bench, and it is freezing outside. You could be going snowing out there right now. But a couple of swipes with this, and then I'll vacuum up the bench just to keep it neat. And what I'm looking to try to do is get it symmetrical right down the whole leading edge. Another way that you can, and, and again, one of the things I can try to pass on from the videos is different ways of holding things. I notice a lot of people, when you hold this in your lap, you tend to squeeze it and break it. But if you get it on the edge of a padded table with some nice old blankets, this is one way you can work on it. Again, the idea is to get both leading edges relatively blunt. You want to see about an eighth inch or a little bit more of that leading edge square. And by the way, it's a significant thing. It's not a little minor baby thing. If this leading edge is too pointy, the plane will tend not to track well. If it's way too blunt, if you made it like this, the, the, like a jar cover in the front, you'd just be adding parasitic drag for nothing. So a nice, when you can see half of that leading edge square, you know you're real close to having it. And that's about what I'm trying to accomplish, is to get just about half of that leading edge sheeting showing. But when you look, I'm just looking at this through the lens, when you look down that wing through the lead out guide, the sucker is straight. At some point in time, you want to harden up this leading edge. I really haven't put a final cut on it, but you want to make sure that you're working with a hard surface here because you have a joint in the wood where it's going from really one kind of grain to another kind of grain and you really never get that front edge exactly perfect unless you can harden it up to some degree just like the edge of a flap or an elevator or whatever and what I like to do run a couple of beads some thin CA just work it right in at the same time I'm squeezing that sheeting down I want to get that leading edge as solid as I can get it right now Again, that leading edge is going to take a tremendous beating in the course of the life of the plane. Bugs are going to hit it. You're going to have klutzy launchers launching it. You're going to klutzy eyes it, <laughs> especially me. Maybe four or five coats of this, and then I can just block sand it down again. And then I want to check it with a little gauge. I want to make up a little gauge. And of course, all the while I'm working on this, I'm looking for any joints that look like they might not be that solid. Anything that looks like it might not be as true and solid or any soft spots in the wood, I can need to harden up. It's an ongoing thing to get, because this, don't forget, this is now going to be ready, I hope, for some block sanding, actually a final sanding. The tips, and we'll be ready to put this wing in the body soon, I hope. What I want to do, I want to trim off the top of these bolts leave just enough up here that I can put a little piece of plywood as a retainer. My sanding blocks are really getting chewed up. I, I want to get a close-up of this. You can see how chewed up this is from using it and working with it and everything. So what I want to do, I want to run this on a belt sander now. This is a nice hard piece of balsa. Run it on a belt sander, put some contact cement and get some brand new paper on here because I want to use this size block. In this, size, this side of the paper is really too rough to be sanding cap strips, but I still have some life in that. But there's no reason I can't use the other side of this. Now, 
always important when you make a block have that little corner broken down. If you don't have that corner broken down, what happened? That corner will be catching and breaking cap strips and everything. Now I want to get some spray contact cement. Get this and a sheet of 220. Let them dry outside. I have to do this outside because it's I don't want to get the smell in the house. Press these down and I'll have a brand new sanding block and then I can sit with that wing for an hour or so. Get it all dressed off before I start working on the tips. At one time I had <clears throat> bought this by mistake. I was in Home Depot and I wanted to try some different cement and I found out, whoops, it melts foam. Usually I would use this for, for doing foam wings. So I put a nice tag on it so I wouldn't, in effect, somebody else in the shop would come in and say, oh yeah, I'm ready to go, boom, boom, boom. But we can also always use it for sanding blocks. So if you happen to buy a can by mistake, it's not a big deal, just use it up on sanding blocks. Now what I did, I went outside, <clears throat> sprayed this, and I'm just waiting for it to tack up. What I mean tack up is when it sticks to your finger, in fact it's almost ready right now. You don't want to wait too long, I'd say usually two or three minutes with this stuff. And what I did, I made up the block that I want to use for most of this sanding. And I also made up, I was making a production run of kits, I wanted to make a, a couple extra sanding blocks. Because we're at the point in time where we're going to be using these like they're candy. And what I do is just lay these out any old random way. Take an X-Acto knife and cut them. And run over to the belt sander and then dress off all the edges. Most important, dress the edges off once these set up. And this should be enough, really. Should be in good shape now finish this whole wing. What I like to do once these dry up is cut them right over newspaper. And again, the thing when people make a mistake making up a sanding block is they leave the edge. You need to cut back that edge, miter it back. I like to do it about 45 degrees. But now if you were to leave this rough edge, this corner is going to catch all the time. It needs a little bit of hand dressing either by hand or even better, if you have a belt sander, just kiss that edge. You know, what I'm doing is letting the sandpaper pick this up and wrap it back. and I just get rid of it. It won't keep it from being a good sanding block. I got rough on one side, 220 on the other side. problem Robert had I think was he was sanding one rib at a time you got to be able to catch at least two now, I'm not trying to make this sheeting any thinner I just want to get that I can't feel the joints when I run my hand over them that they're smooth same thing up here I'm working over a blanket so every once in a while I can take the blanket outside and just dump it And obviously, the bigger the sand block, you, sanding block you can make, the better it is. The larger you can make it. We had that real nice sticky back paper at one time when we made those giant sanding blocks. I'm going to have to get some more of that. See, I don't want to catch the corner on a cap strip. I'm trying to keep the corners in open bays when I do this. As soon as I have it that I can't feel a joint, I'm done. I go on to the next bay. Now whenever you think you want to do, just do a little check. 
just sight down. You don't want to see any sticking up high or any sticking, any dropping low. You want them to all be in a complete plane if possible. I just want to see if I'm picking up any high spots here. This will usually get rid of any mountain tops that you have along the way. Now another way, if you really were concerned about having one high or low, is take a, a red ink marker and mark each one. And take a big block like this and just sand it down until you have the red, you see that you're scratching into it. And then you would know pretty much what you, what you hope for anyway. Whoops is that every one of these is going to be perfectly straight. You also can do it this way. You can lay a ruler on it if you have a straight ruler. But the idea is to avoid having one real high, one real low, so you have that nice smooth airfoil shape. This little gauge just to check before I go any further that I have, maybe every so often I have just a little test that I don't have one side a lot rounder than the other side and I can just go right down the whole wing this way and if I see one side is not as round as the other obviously I can bring them so they're both the same pretty much you can check at every rib station this looks pretty decent I'll save the gauge so when we build these wings in the future and obviously we're going to be building some of them that one of the things we'll have is we'll have a good reference gauge to get them all the same Now one of the things I want to do, I want to tack glue the blocks on, that's probably all I'm going to get to do today. I'm expecting Ken to come over today and we're going to do some work on the Nova, but if I can get the, the blocks tacked on, that would be one more thing. And I'm always trying to do my time management so I get the most out of whatever amount of time I have available. I got the blocks all cut, we cut these on a, on a previous tape, I've got the ones marked inboard outboard, so that's zip boom bang now what I need to do is get these tacked together real quick I gotta shake that blanket out of course lay them flat on a table get them lined up on the front this gives you a nice flat parallel surface and now I can just run up maybe one drop every inch or so because of course I want to be able to pop them apart It's always good when you're tacking them to do a little sanding on each side, just let the dust stay in there. The dust acts like a good filler and allows you to just make a nicer joint, easier to pop apart. And I'm sure everybody's had that problem that when you go to pull them apart, you, you snack them all up. Just want to get the blocks totally trued up. Okay, I'm ready to tack glue these in place. Now the first thing I want to do is make sure that this is a true surface and it's not off 90 degrees. I want it 90 degrees straight up and down. Now of course I'll sight it from the front and the back. First I want to get a nice flat edge so I get a decent joint when I go to join this. Now because I try to squeeze all these out of one block, I cut them a little short. I'm going to put a little spacer in there, but I don't want to cheat the front. This won't matter as much as the back. Just get it on center. Now what I'm trying to do is, let's see if we can do, is look from the front and make sure I don't have this and I don't have that. And if I do, I could take two choices. I could true the block up on a belt sander or I could true some of this off if there was a hard spot sticking out here. 
And now I want to just get this pinned in. Just get it pinned in with a couple of pins. In fact, line up the center here. Center line at a wood, center line at a leading edge. Oh, it looks like I'm a little bit high here, so I'll pull this apart and dress this one edge off. Now it's this little stuff like this, just getting a couple of swipes of the sandpaper in there. It'll serve a lot of purposes. You'll get a better joint, of course. Don't be afraid to just pull it apart and do it over if it's not real nice and straight. Oh, it's one thing nice you can do when you're pinning this on. You can pin it, pin the ribs right to the block. Make sure all the center lines are lined up. And then the next thing I want to do, I want to get a a nice ballpoint pen. Hopefully one that writes. Trace out the shape and see how much of this I can take off with my big band saw. Usually you can take quite a bit off. Leave the line on. Always put a nice thick line and leave the line on. Now when I take these pins out, I have marked on there just how much I'll be able to take off. It'll just save me a lot of carving. This really does save you a lot of time, a lot of carving. I always want to leave the line on. This is why I threw up the blocks before I put them on. Because now the other side of the block is a 90 that I'm working off for a reference. Needless to say, a saw like this will take your arm right off. So you want to be careful. Just get an eye just by doing that, just how much you do save. And of course, you need to have this edge flat so you get a good reference. Otherwise, you're going to be cutting a crazy shape into it. But that really is a good time saver. Tip worth its weight in pepperoni. Now just for a reference, I want to get a center line on the sides of the blocks. Just give me something to start a rough carving to. Now I can do a lot of the rough carving without having it attached to the wing. The advantage of that is I don't have to bang and beat the wing against the wall and a ceiling. And we live in a, a very confined space here. If you have a real big shop, a Tom Morris kind of shop, that wouldn't be a problem. But when you have a windy kind of shop, everything you're always banging into the ceilings and walls and this is just for my reference. What I try to do get a relatively decent number 26 blade, do a lot of, a lot of the rough carving, just lopping off big pieces. Finish that up with a plane. Again, I'm just this is just the roughest of rough. Roughing the block out before I actually tack glue it on is at least the way I prefer to do it having done many of these. Sounds professional, doesn't it? Having done many of these. Anyway. There's a key to this. If you go slow and take little, the smallest pieces possible, you're a lot better off than somebody who just lops in with a chainsaw and now it's too small and you have to add little pieces. Relatively decent piece of wood, so I'm expecting we'll have decent wingtips. To me, the wingtips, just, just to mention that, just like on a Nobler, the wingtips are a focal part of the plane. You just can't skimp on this. This is something that, it's going to be time consuming. It may take a couple of sessions, I don't know. But well worth it. Well worth the time and effort. 
because when this is all done to have that that carved shape and actually I was real happy that Robert got that it took him a little time but it was it was nice to see that he's picked up on having that instead of just having those sheet little wingtips that look like beer cans or something Again, what I always try to do is work from one side down to a center line, then try to match that side to that side, and once I get one block done, then I'll work on the other one. The reason for that is, if, if you do the outer tip first, I think you're better off, because if you screw this up, this is not your best piece of wood. The inboard tip, which is the best, supposedly the lightest piece of wood you would have, would be on the inboard tip, so if this one needs a patch or a some extra bondo or something really not a big deal but this one you want to keep ultra light if possible and again at some point in time you can start taking ice shavings off with the plane always working toward that center line though and watching that you leave the line on on the other side don't go even close to the line Yeah, starting a rough end. I always try to do this. I always try to feel with the feel, try to get the last little bit. I think I'd feel a high spot right there. This, of course, is a great time to get a new blade in that master ass screw plane. Don't be a cheapo, don't be a windy. The idea is we get a lot of this material off before we even tack glue this on a wing. This is about ready though. But again, I'll get this on, make sure it's 90 degrees, tack glue it on, and I'll do the final part of this sanding as I true it right into the wing tip. So you get an idea just how much material you can actually get off of these blocks before you ever put them on the, on the wing itself makes it a lot easier. Okay, these are pretty much ready to tack glue in place. I want to get some pins, pin them in place, tack glue them on. This is about where this session is going to end. I thought we'd get more done here, but Kenny's here with the Nobler and I want to Take advantage of the fact that it's a dry day. There's almost no humidity out there. Try to get some primer on his uh, his nobler project. See, we have to work around the weather. The weather determines what we what we can and can't do here. And today looks dry. We're supposed to have snow this weekend. Okay, I'm guessing we're ready. If we can take advantage of this day. Fantastic. All right, what we'll let's start masking this sucker off. You want to pull that tape off of there? Yeah. Let's back mask the canopy first, and then back mask the tissue as the first thing. Well, I want to take a few minutes. And just... Okay, we're just laying out some tape, just trying to go back and forth and see. We want to keep the traditional old-time look of having this all clear in here. And I want to use the, the wall prey method with the tin foil, which we've done probably 8 million times already. But basically, I want to get through this and get this all back masked off. And most of this will be on the Noble Construction finishing video, so 
just for now, I just want to get a little look just to show you where we are in this time and place. This is what I like about being a boss. I get to sit in the house, have warm cups of coffee, and Kenny gets out there with the ice cold spray gun in his hand. Ah. It's looking pretty good, pretty good. Man, I'm telling you, it's looking real good. And I like the wheel pants, by the way. It's such a creative <laughs> shape. What is this, snowshoes or something? Pontoons or what? Oh, man. Wow. Ooh. Wait till you see this under the Christmas tree. We have more footage of this on the Brodak Nobler video number six, the finishing video, but I, I couldn't resist just putting a minute or two on here. It looks so nice. We are really freezing out here, though. Not we. <laughs> what is this, Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic? We, no. <laughs> Kenny's, how cold is that gun? It's like holding a piece of ice, huh? No, it's a lot colder than that. Yeah, I, can't feel I believe it. Anymore. Get the edges. Extra on the edges. Another way you can cheat the system, you really don't have to spray up on the, the tape edge because that edge is going to fade away. We're going to back mask it. You don't need to make a, an exact line there. We're not going to use that line, but the edges is where where it's really going to show. The side of the body where those tissue joints were, right. that's a spot you want to hit a little, even though it looks pretty good. This little fillet up in here, that's another spot. Here. Okay, just, just put extra. Use up all the material we mixed. Now what's going to happen is I'm going away for a week. Not a week. Two weekends in a week. And so this is going to sit by a heating vent. And the reason we actually rushed through to get this done on such a crappy day is while I'm away, we want to put this up by a heating vent. Maybe Kenny will get it sanded or whatever, but the longer you let it dry, the easier it'll be to do the sanding. Anyway, we return to the scene of the crime here. It's too cold to be outside. See, if I was a bird, I'd be in this house right now. I wouldn't be out here freezing. You got a dry spot up on the leading edge here. This is what a dry spot looks like. Let me just focus in on it. Where the tissue is coming through, that's where you want to just, just put extra on. Because you'll bury it in paint and sand it right out. By the way, the fillets look really good. The fillets are beautiful. Usually by now, the fillets are looking like somebody took bites out of them and worms are coming out of them and aliens are eating them. That looks great. That epoxy stuff is looking better. Aero epoxy is looking better and better. Definitely is looking good. You want to give plenty on those little gear fairings too. You know why I'm thinking? They're going to take an ass whipping up at the club field. Or actually any way you fly it. They're gonna take a beating, the trailing edge of the flaps. Did you get the did you get the hinge lines from the top yet? Yeah. We'll okay. Hit those again. Yeah. The top of his body always takes a beat. Yeah, you got dry spots up here too, yeah, Ken. Exactly. Okay, in that fillet, it's not gonna hurt to have extra pain in there. Got the little fiberglass cowl getting its first coat of silver. plane is a unit. Yeah, now you get to see the real shape. Actually, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you gotta be crazy. Go put it in a vise. Don't do dumb stuff. That's gonna fall over. Put it in a vise. That's not gonna fall. Put, put it somewhere with a it rock or something. Yesterday. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he's, he's not lying. <laughs> you know what, right now, i tell you the truth. This is a true story. John DeTavio had a JD Falcon. It looked just, it was sitting exactly like this in clear and all buffed out and he went downstairs in a cellar of his house and he heard meow thump and the plane broke right in half that's an absolute true story ask him if you think i'm kidding come on it's too cold to be out here finish this and let's get out of here put another coat on and don't worry how cold you are when this thing is sitting by the heating vent tonight tomorrow and all next week you'll be thinking Boy, that Wendy knew a lot. Oh, man. Look at that. Outrageous. A mean guy. But he knew a lot.
No matter how cold you are, just keep spraying. We're going to use that up, use all of this material. All right. And we got yellow coming through in here. All right. So you're really going to have, you're going to wind up with one coat on the bottom and probably two and a half coats on the top, which is about right. All right. You should have one more gun load of stuff there. Shake it up real good before you load the gun. Shake, shake, shake. Shake, 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 Sinora. Hey, it's looking good, I have to tell you. He's a good student. I kid him, but he's a good student. Somebody made these videos back when I was a kid. I could have had a plane like this, gone to the Nats, gone head to head with Jerry Sipra. Okay, now we both have nice planes. Oh. It came too late in life. Here I'm 52 years old. Just a little too late in life to go back and relive that stuff. What happens in this kind of cold weather. Now, we, we normally wouldn't do something like this. We wouldn't put this much filler on all at once. But because it's so cold, what's going to happen? This is going to take a long time to dry, and it'll dry relatively flat. It'll really be easier to sand then if you were doing this in a red hot day in a blazing sun you'd have all kind of orange peel to deal with hey Kenny put one hand on a plane it's uh, for some reason all of a sudden we're getting yeah we're getting some wind here just be ready to catch it if the wind blows there we are videotaping all of a sudden bong were you in Flushing when uh, Relentless blew over and, and hit Henry's toolbox and broke in half a week before the Nats? You were there when that I was, happened. I was there. I saw the look on your face. Yeah, I'm looking. To this day, I'd like to execute Henry. Of course, it was my fault, but why should I take the blame? Yeah, it's looking good. Just use up the material. Now, see, here's what the silver shows you. You see right by the canopy tent? Look right here. You see the little imperfection? Oh, yeah. You can hit that with the green stuff tomorrow. All the things I thought were just going to go away. No, no. Now, uh, no, no, they're not going to go away. <laughs> you got a dry spot on a flap back here. This is a dry spot you want to hit. The top of the turtle deck, for some reason, is real dry. It might be that you sanded through, because it's I a think point. I sanded through. Okay. Other than that, it looks pretty decent. I think even Steve the Julia would be impressed. Oh, here's a spot you missed. Right out here, it's a dry spot. Let's see if we can show this. Just dry stuff going. Go yeah. hit the whole tip. Who cares? You're going to put tip weight out there anyway, so who cares? Wind lines. Then I'll move the controls. Wait, we're only moving the other way. hundred coats up on the nose here because this will sand right out. There's no problem with that. Any yellow showing through anywhere that you can yeah, see? Yeah, right along in here. See, actually the yellow tissue is a good thing because it shows where you have the paint thin here in this case. So you get a nice even coat of filler on this way. I would just shoot it into the wingtip guide too just so that's fuel proof if you get some oil in there. Under the conditions we're painting outside today, we needed to use 50 pounds to force that filler through the gun, and it is really getting colder by the minute out there. That'll really dry up nicely, though. Anyway, hope he's out there finishing it up, because I'm getting, getting ammonia just sitting in here drinking coffee. From the outside there's nothing better than a nice cup of coffee Ooh. hey if you live in california you don't know what you're missing drink about four cups of coffee now and be ready to go back to work i love it that coffee is delicious it's warm and he's still out there painting kenny you're okay i don't care what john brodak says about you 
Anyway, he's really getting intense with this project. Yeah, you can see a couple of little imperfections in the cowl coming through that you normally wouldn't see without the silver. Silver filler, this is the latest thing we've been trying to perfect the system of using this. So far it looks like it's good. How you doing out there? Freezing! <laughs> I'm thinking about you live. <laughs> I'm having another cup of coffee to hell with you. He's still out there, I can't believe it. Well he's out there, he's putting a third coat of filler on that thing. I got my moles all prepped. I'm going to try to get all my fiberglass work done here tonight and go upstairs and take a hot shower because it has been a long day. Nice guy. I even bring him a cup of hot coffee. Yeah, the compressor. The gun. The <laughs> gun and shoot you. How's it looking? Looks it's good. Looking good. All right. You I'm just... thinking about July. Yeah. Sitting out in the sun with this at the Nats. Someone will come along and say, well, how did you do that? And I'll say, well, oh. gee, I put a couple of coats of clear on, and then yeah. there was some fill. Well, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're a controversial old man. <laughs> All right. Have some coffee. Let that dry for a minute before you put in. And you could just do the edges one more time, and that's it. That's it, baby. It's getting dark out here. All set to run off a bunch of molding stuff, and I just been told I forgot all about it. Tonight is my haircut appointment, so tomorrow I'll have my Marines haircut. We'll work on this tomorrow. See you then. And today, what I found to be, and I don't, I don't know if this is really even something worth mentioning, what I found to be a tremendous help here is in the past what I've what I've done is take one one of these rubber molds at a time, make a part clean up, put all the stuff away. Then the next day, somebody would order another cardinal cowling or whatever, and I'd tool up and make another one. Oh, man. What I've done in the, the past two or three times I've done it, and it's worked out real well. I figured I'd put this on the tape. I've, I've laid out all the molds, got everything ready, got all the cloth ready, and got them all done in the same setting. And by the way, this haircut does look good. <laughs> yeah, right. But anyway, one of the things, now I've been doing a little time study on this, and it takes about a half an hour for me to lay one of these up. So what would happen is it would be a half hour three times in a row. Well, what it happens now is in 40 minutes I can do the whole job because I'm not cleaning up and setting up. and It's, it's like that time management thing where you get a little bit ahead, and this is a good way to do it. If you have more than one mold, do them all at once. These are coming out flawlessly, by the way. They're really nice. And this is really where the biggest gain is, is when you can lay up three at once, and there's only one cleanup and only one mix of the resin, I can chop the time to that just about in half. That's a good tip if you're playing around. And we're going to be making fiberglass wheel pans soon, so I'm already thinking multi-cavity mold. God has been good to me. <laughs> It's raining and snowing out there right now. I'm glad we got that paintwork done. I want to try to get these wingtips tacked on. Maybe do a little carving and sand in here. I really don't have a lot of time today, but another point of time management is when you have little bits of time, try to use them on something productive. You know, even though I don't have a whole day to spend, even if I get one or two of the wingtips sanded out, I'm a little bit ahead of the game. I like to use pins on the inside, make sure I have this lined up as well as I can. Then I want to flip it up and just sight that I'm true from the front before I go and tack this on. Obviously I'll do the other one exactly the same. And I just want to get a couple of tacks of CA on here. And I want to get some masking tape across here to give me a little dead stop when I start sanding this in. If you just twist the fins just a little bit, they usually will come usually will come right out. Now the tape is just there as a little bit of a dead stop so you don't get the the joint really super thin. 
this is one way that works real well at getting a nice fit on these outer parts. Check that I don't have this off to one side or the other from front and back. Now this wing tip really needed a lot of little dressing to get a nice seam. Sometimes they do and so I don't know why. Sometimes they don't. They just line up real nice. Anyway, once this is tacked on, I can get over at the sanding table. Try to get some sanding on this. Oh, I hate when the first snow of the year comes. Oh, man. Anyway, this should be ready to sand. Now, if you're doing this for the first time, what you may want to do is use two layers of tape to give you some extra... Make sure these attack on. Give you a little bit of extra material that when you get them hollowed, you can get that final shape in there. Starting to look like a cardinal wing at last. The first thing I like to do is true up the leading edge, get that shape in right. This is where having that tape on there is a big help. In fact, this one is so close I'm ready to go to the big block. Usually I like to get most of it roughed off. I try to make up a little blanket over this over the bench here so I could work over this, keep the sawdust to a minimum anyway. Now there's still a little bit here I can plane off. I don't need to take all that. In fact I could see if I was really prepared I'd know this. I could take a little bit of this off and you can set the plane to really take some ice shavings off just a little bit. Well, I just love these carved tips. This is one of my, one of the high points of, I guess all cardinals, not only this one. Even Robert, I know in the back of his mind, loves those wing tips. A little extra work, but I think it's worth it. Anyway, you get an idea just about how much more material I have to take off and the rest. Now that I'm down, I'm almost down here that I can almost touch it. Now I can do the rest with a sanding block. What I like to do, I have a sanding block with sandpaper, but I need to rough this out. Is take a much rougher, this is 120 in fact, take a rougher piece, and what that sandpaper does, it holds it in position while you're doing the work. And you can remove a lot of material this way. As soon as you see you're coming up on a tape, that's it. Boy, again, I went to the post office this afternoon. I looked at the snow and the ice and everything out there, and I said, oh, man, am I glad we painted that noble yesterday. Now, no matter how much snow we get over the weekend, Ken's got that guy sitting home, sitting by the heating vent, drying up. It's a good feeling to get that. Once the dope is sitting there drying, good feeling. And once I get this roughed out, then I'll just remove the sandpaper and go on to using the, the 220. And then the last little bit I'll get off just by taking it, the tape off. But I like to do that after I get it all hollowed out. work 
forth the point. I remember Robert having trouble barbing these tips, and it's really not that hard. You got to work toward the point. So I guess the bottom line is the winter did beat us. The weather. We really were trying to put the push on to get both the nobler and this out there before the snow turned our field into a mud puddle. The field is half underwater by now. But this will just give us extra time to do a super nice paint job. Looking forward to doing a really nice paint job on this. Actually, it's funny, I'm, I'm having as much or more fun working on a profile here as I was working on more complex models. And it's given me extra time to think about that next Spitfire project, the Supermarine. I got air racer paint jobs floating around in my head, and the more time I can spend doing that, I want to come up with something really nice. I get down to the point here where I'm doing the last couple of ice shavings with the sander. I don't want to do that with the rough paper. I want to take the 220. I want to get this to blend right up on the tape if I can, but I don't want to make it smaller because I want to have that last little bit to remove after I hollow this out. So this is one of the just the more delicate things and I don't care if I make a little dust here on the table because I'm only trying to get that seam finalized right now and I can finalize it right with the tape. Oh, when you get that seam just right. Oh, so nice. Now, with all the sanding done, I want to pull the tape off. Make sure I don't have any little spots where this is not tied right in nice. And I don't think I'm going to get a lot more done today. Because, well, I, what I want to do, I want to put these little radiuses in here if I can. It just has the look of a lost cause. I see there's a pile of mail just came in. Wow, look at this. I chewed up a piece of sheeting now. That's nice. I'm going to have to make a little plug here. Well, good. let's use it as an opportunity to show getting a plug. Now, see what happened. I'm trying to use up all this old masking tape so I don't wind up using it on a paint job. And what happened, it was so strong, it actually tore the sheeting. So I'm going to see if I can, yeah, I can pull this piece right out of here. It's the kind of stuff that only happens. You think it only happens to you or to Steve DeGiulio or somebody, but it happens to everybody. And I got that little piece. See, maybe you shouldn't use up the old tape. Maybe you should not listen to anything I say. Anyway, there we go. Yeah, and I think Kenny picked up on a good point. He said, you know, what's great about working in the shop here, he's enjoyed it, of course, is that you can never get in trouble. You break things, and if you know how to fix them, you know how to cover up your mistakes. Yeah, I remember Les McDonald telling me it's better to know how to cover your errors up than to do good stunt patterns, and obviously it worked for him. I should be so successful. I should be so successful. Anyway. Now, see, what I want to do... Come on, you tape what? using up this whole junk. What I want to do, I want to match the little radius in there with a little piece in here, but I want the grain to go this way. I don't want to have the grain this way or this way. I want it on our 45, so what I want to do is get a couple little pieces of wood, overcut them, get them in these corners, and then I'll just use the Dremel drum to get in there and cut that out. I want to cut four pieces, but I want the grain. It's, it's really important. It sounds like this it sounds like little details like this wouldn't really matter. I don't know. They, to me, they matter. And when I see a plane that has all these little details, that's when I start thinking, oh, boy. 
took the time. Now, if you make these things with the grain going in the opposite direction or in the wrong direction, they'll be very weak and flimsy. And we need eight of them all together. So, easiest to do it, just take and rip them off with a 45 degree triangle. Now what happens, every time I go to glue these, or something like this, you know what happens. You glue your hand right to the part. More fingers have been glued to more parts. That's a good little tip for you. Anyway, now what I want to do, I want to get the Dremel tool and run at a real slow speed, just get that radius in there. Trick here, just get a slow speed. And you know you're going to have all the radiuses match then. And boy, that is a nice little final touch. Now see, this one doesn't have a perfect 90 degree fit here. I probably cut this a little sloppy. And I want to get a nice, a nice tight fit on this before I try to glue it. I don't know, is it just some Billy Simons told me one time. He says he was down at the shop and it was kind of an interesting day, and we were talking about the different planes. And he said, Wendy, the one thing about your planes, they always have these little details on them, these little edges and corners. And I didn't realize then what he really was talking about, but I understand now. And he's right. Come on, kick off. There you go. See, I always rest my hand on something when I'm doing it. I try to, like a sign painter would do, I guess. I don't know, I like that. That I think is just one nice little touch. Now this is probably going to be the last thing I get to do in this session. We're starting to put a fireplace in our bedroom, kind of a phony fireplace. And I want to get the material for that, so I don't want to spend the whole day working on model planes today. Anyway, it's that time of year where guaranteed you're not going to go flying. So early in the morning you can plan a little... What I like to do is plan a little work session in the morning, do some work around the house, rake some leaves, whatever, and then plan a little session in the evening. So I try to get two sessions in in a day. If I can, of course, if Karen allows me to. <sighs> yeah, I like that. Just as an example, you just go from one side to the other. I don't know, I... <laughs> Details. Anyway, that's probably, I'm going to finish this up, and we'll see you as soon as I get to work on this again in the next session. Now one of the things that I do that I notice a lot of people don't really do, and this is a good time to put a minute or two of this on video, I like to do maintenance at the end of the flying season. We got our first snow of the year, not really a snow, just a snow sprinkling. And that's the time of year that I usually resign myself to the fact that 
I'm not going to be going flying anymore. And I want to get into the, the meat and potatoes of the building season here. Now what I've seen a lot of people do is at this point in time they take the plane and just stick it in either the cellar or a rack or something. And what typically happens, springtime comes, the tank is full of rust and corrosion, the filters all full of junk. They wind up inevitably getting about seven lean runs on a motor, ruin the ring seal. I've seen that happen over and over and over again. So what I always do is that I take, I have three planes that I'm still actively flying. Strega we're using to develop more props. We have the Spitfire, which is the backup plane, and the Seafire, which in, in theory is still our number one plane. May not be real soon though, we don't know. We'll get another one of these guys built. But the object of this is, I want to start off next season now. I want to start for sure. First off, that the finish isn't all full of corrosion and pits and, and whatever. That's one thing. I want to make sure most of all I don't fill up this tank with garbage. Over the winter time we're in a cellar with air heat, the, the temperature's changing constantly. And what happens, that tank is getting, go look at a, the windows of your car in the morning. Moisture is condensing inside of it. So what I always like to do is, number one, fill up all the fuel tanks with fuel and cap them off. Number two, clean the whole plane. In this case, this plane is pretty clean. I'm just going to put a coat of pledge on everything. And maybe once a month or once every two months, I'll take the time. Really, I'll take more than the time I'm taking now even. And get a nice coat of wax. Get off all the sawdust from working down here in the cellar. And it may seem like a meaningless, silly thing that, ah, yeah, 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 you don't have to do that. But, but the point is, if I want to use this plane next year in the Nats or in, in local contests or whenever, this plane is a 20-point plane. What I really want to have is I want it to stay. I don't want it to become a 19-point plane, then an 18, a 15, and then the, I want to do the maintenance on it. And number one is this is the time of year you have to kind of resign yourself to the fact there's going to be a little bit of maintenance involved in no matter what you do. And I got, because it's, it's early in the day here, I'm waiting for my son to get back, in fact. This is a good time to kill a half an hour an hour and get all this maintenance done. Get that tank full of fuel, make sure the wheels have a little bit of oil on them, make sure there's no grit and grime. Keep the finish looking nice. And actually, one of the things, I just plain enjoy having a nice looking plane. Even if we couldn't fly this, or we didn't want to fly it, or we wanted to hang it up in John Brodak's office or something, what I want to do is, I just want to have nice stuff. And that, that's about it. Okay, now this one has, tank is full of fuel, it's capped off, it's waxed, it's cleaned. The wheels are nice. In fact, you know what? It's going to need new wheels. We've been wearing the wheels out on this thing. Got a lot of flying on it, and as far as I can tell, it's still a flawless airplane. And I want it to be a flawless airplane next year, the year after, the year after that, the year after that. I want it to stay flawless as long as possible. Now I know a lot of people don't think it's significant and I know I hear all this, the counterpoint to my point of view all the time. Ah, you spend so much time waxing and polishing and buffing, but you know what the bottom line is now? This is a plane. This plane was made in 94, the winter of 94. 94, this, this is a three or four year old plane already, and I think it's still in pretty nice shape. I think this plane still might be in the first couple of rows. And even with a little extra Gorham's, I think we could maybe even get it back into the front row. But I still want to have it as a test plane. I want to have it as a plane. I want to do more work on those five bladed props in the next year. And I, it's a lot easier for me to do it on a plane like this. This is more representative of the plane that that would ultimately work work best for the person who's going to buy one. The average person is not flying a Spitfire. They're flying a plane that's a lot more like this. We've also tinkered with another idea that's come up several times between Ken and other people that have been in the shop here. Rich Peabody personally likes this plane a lot and had another idea. Why not make a profile version of this for like we're making a profile Cardinal, a profile Strega. Well, we already have the uh, the technology to do that, to shrink it down a little bit, make a little bit smaller version, that would really be a nice thought. One of the thoughts, anyway. One of the things I'll be talking to John Brodak about, probably in the near future, and I hope he's 
it's one thing he already has plans to this plane and ribs we have a lot of choices as long as this stays in nice shape you have even another choice is you don't have to build any plane at all you can use the same plane like some of our national competitors it seems like they have the same plane for four or five years that's great and it shows that you've built some longevity into the plane another thing whenever you have taped hinge lines getting the oil out of the hinges it's always a good idea to put it in the rack upside down for one day so that any of the gook that's in there drips out that's another just a little tip anyway now this is one i've got to take special care with i've had the engine and tank out i want to make sure the tank is clean i want to flush it with a couple of tanks of fuel i want to bring in from the car all my batteries and all my gizmos and go through that clean it all up get it ready so when springtime comes a flying season starts bing i'm ready to go flying And ultimately, I guess the test is, now we got through a whole season last year, never had to fly this once. So this has been sitting in the rack for a year with fuel in it. We actually never had to fly this once. We didn't need, have any need for a backup plane, but the original Spitfire, of course. And this is the whole idea is, you know, if, if this season came up where, and it looks like there might be a time when you want to go through a winter without building a plane for some reason, working on your house, raising kids, or you're just lazy. Hey, that's come into it in my program. Or you want to go to a lot of giant games and watch them lose or whatever. What's nice is if you have one of these in a rack and you've done the maintenance, as Joe Adamusco says, he loves to look over at his rack. And hey, to me, this is still, this is probably still a front row plane. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that many people have this many decent planes sitting in their living room. Nicely finished models. And if you can pick up some of this technology off the videos, this is such an important thing to me. Just being able to pick this up, that you don't have to learn a lot of it the hard way. You don't have to get to the spring and all of a sudden your tank is a hunk of rust. And that's even more important if you've, at some point in time, made a plane like an original Nobla, original Thunderbird or whatever, where the tank is glued in and you can't get it out. It's even twice as important. In this case, we could if we had to rip it out and put another tank in. But why do that? Why spend the money or the time or the energy or whatever? This is a good time. I don't know, I love the building season, I have to tell you. I almost wish you didn't have to go flying. We could just build all the time. Build and buff. Sounds like a comedy show, the build and buff show. But anyway. Having that rack full of planes, I know Joe feels the way I do, and I'm sure Ken does too. I'm sure there's a lot of Joe, Jimmy Borelli to name others. I know Bob Gildini used to tell me, Ted Fancher, to just love, just love having the planes. It's just so nice. And these guys are sitting here, fuel and glow plug away from being ready to fly. As Joe says, it's an Air Force. Hey, nice canopy. I remember doing that canopy. Time well spent. Believe me, maintenance is always time well spent. Things I always do, take my batteries. I have three batteries all the time in a toolbox. Since the last time we've been flying, it's probably a month. This one still looks good. But what will always happen is, if you don't keep these fully charged, it can be a problem. But, now here, just what I just said. This one's stone dead. So that one I want to charge. Some of these are a lot older than other ones, too. In fact, it may be time to, this one looks good. But the point is, it's the maintenance. If you keep after the batteries and don't let them get low on charge, you don't wind up every year having to buy new batteries. And that one is stone dead, even though we haven't, no reason. Well, I'll give all of them a little bit of a charge, a couple hours. I'll let that one sit overnight and the other two, let it sit just a little while. I'll leave a glow plug out so I remember to test it. And if a battery's going bad, then for sure what I want to do is in the beginning of next year, no sense ordering it now. We're not going to use it in our snowblower, but have it ready for the spring. Always want to have three batteries because you'll always get to the end of one battery and then when, then in effect what you have is one battery at the field. And the day that happens, 
It'll be a beautiful fly-in day, and you'll be, oh, God, and you have to run home and get the other battery. Let's go through all my, all my props. This will be a good time to check everything out. Make sure everything is in, I have all the spinners, the bolts, all the props in order. Gives me a little chance to go back through my inventory, think of anything I might need, something I might want to get ready for the spring. In fact, I have an extra battery charger and I can charge two at once. What a thrill. Now tonight what I want to do, the object of doing all this is to try to get everything in the rack squared away, put away for the winter. We really, once it snows, again, I've said it over and over, once it snows I pretty much know what I'm going to do for the rest of the season. And again, I'm really disappointed. I was hoping we'd get a little bit of a better break on the weather. Never happened. But again, it's that old adage, it's, it's not important to have a good hand of cards. It's important to learn how to play a bad hand well. I think Don King gets the credit for that little quote. But anyway, I want to put the, the motor to prop everything right back in Strega where we left off last year. And this is why I always save all my stuff exactly how I had it in here. The motor mount bolts, the tubings and everything. I can clean and flush everything. So we start the season next season. Hopefully, obviously, we're not going to start with a brand new plane, but we'll have the Profile Cardinal to fly. We'll have Spitfire, Seafire, and Strega. And I hope we'll even have the I-Beamer. And again, the nice thing is Joe is coming up next Saturday. So we should be getting ready to put some final plans together on what we're going to do and exactly how we're going to do that I-Beam Seafire. All the Strega hardware ready to bolt right back with all the tank shims and everything. And we'll be right back to where we were. How convenient, because if we didn't do this, now you'd have to figure out the tank shim. Oh, man. Bill full of fuel should be perfectly clean. I even marked the, the setup block in here. <clears throat> oh, boy. I remember these shims being a son of a gun to get in and out. That's why it's always good to have them. It saves you all that extra work. We should even have the... The last needle valve setting that was on the plane with, if we haven't disturbed that, that should still be the same. Ah, wrong. See, this is what happens. You forget you need a different piece of aluminum threaded rod. Yes. Yeah, it feels real good to have all that stuff ready to go. Springtime is coming, there'll be no snow, there'll be new flowers, and we'll have some new stuff to fool around with. Again, just looking around, another thing, Russ called me today. He's going to be coming by, maybe, maybe tomorrow even, as soon as he can get a day off of work. Do some more work on this guy. Boy, I'll tell you, there's so many interesting things. John DeTavio's going to be here. It's going to be a good week next week. Now, you can see what I've been playing with today. Rather than working on aeroplanes, I made up this fireplace mantle with all this, I don't know, it's fiber molding or fiberglass molding, whatever it is. Anyway, it worked out pretty good. I had some, some scraps, and it cuts real easy with a chop saw. Real nice to use. Anybody wants to... Uh, have a class on mantle making. Anyway, this is one of the things we're doing to the house over the winter time. This basically was a Sunday afternoon project and a lot of fun to make. Put Uniflow back in, right? All right. Today we got a little repair to do for Russ Hunsberger. I hope this is going to be a quick, easy repair. 
Oh. Anybody that doesn't go back over the years of video, what what year did we make this plane in '62? <laughs> no, Notice the amount of electrosets. This plane gained four ounces in electrosets. That's, that's Buster. Yeah, it is my cat. He died. Yeah. Anyway, Russ has got the the other plane that he's been working on. Home doing his electroset thing. You can add up to four four ounces of electroset. Anyway, these letters worked out well, too. Do you remember where we got these? Yeah, where did we get these from? Graphics are in Reading. Okay, the graphics shop. Yeah. That would be a nice thing to use on the uh, on the other plane. We will. I like them. Next plane's in fact, In fact, i got to find out, if talking about graphics, ask the guy if we can get them that will say a cardinal. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any any flavor you want, will you? Any, any yeah, style. yeah. I'd like to get them that say cardinal. Does he make all different colors, too? Any color you want. Neon stuff. Okay, yeah, well, I'll have to look into it. Now, what are we going to do? You want to take the cowling off of this? The cowling off. Okay. And uh, what happened? Last time we ran, I think something happened. We had a little yeah, crack Yeah, it was here. some kind of crack we got to fix. Okay, pull it apart and let's see what's going on okay. with this guy. We need a little wrench. Yeah, I remember doing that. That was something. This was a major operation. That's a beautiful thing. See, now we can mold that out of fiberglass. That's what's nice about now. We the Next time we make one of those cows, yep. fiberglass. No more of that wood nonsense, boy. Now, see, I have a tank out of here, Wendy. So it's just a matter of which one you want to use. Yeah, hold that flashlight in there. You can see right up on the top of the tank floor, there's a crack. Yeah. Now, what'll be good is we'll get some fiberglass cloth in by that tank box, too. We'll make a shim. Do you have the real tank shims that went in here? Yes, indeed. And see where the paint is cracked on the outside here? Yeah. Okay. That I can probably live with the cracked paint, but... No, yeah. the paint is nothing. Get it that it doesn't doesn't be a problem. Yeah. This cowl actually, I'm laughing, but it is in good shape except for the paint. This is from raw fuel up in the front here. Yep. Actually, this is in real good shape. I don't know what we're complaining about here. But if it was fiberglass, it'd still be better. This would be an easy piece to make out of fiberglass, too. Get out some eighth inch plywood to make side tank shims because we do have, let's show this on the tape. You got a tank there? Yep. Here's the deal. And this is a good way, If I, I did this for Bill Rich one time and it worked real well. If you have a crack in a plywood, you see how this tank, it's, because he's got a wide body, this tank has some side to side clearance. Well I know I can use eighth inch light ply to make side shims here. And it'll still just fit, so you'll still just be able to get the tank out. So all I need, I got the height here, and then we'll fiberglass them right in. That's clean as a whistle inside by the way. Yeah. I'm amazed. I made it a little bit oversized. Just a bit. I want to get a tight fit if I possibly can. See, that's almost a press fit in there, Russ? Yeah. That's what I need. I'll just put this on a sanding just a hit. belt and just touch it. What we're going to use is some real high-tech exotic stuff here. I made a pattern for the shim, and they're both a little bit different. And I made the dimensions that I want to increase them. This is actually end grain balsa that has a layer of pre-cured fiberglass on both sides. Super light. It's probably not a whole lot heavier than the balsa wood would be if you just lightened it up. But I want to trace this out on here and actually make the shims out of this end grain balsa material. And then I want to fiberglass, epoxy them right in position inside and use the tank to hold them apart while it's drying. So it'd be kind of a unique way to do a repair like this. But any plane that has a vibration problem, this will be a one, one alternative way of making it uh, a little bit stronger, a little bit sturdier. And I hope this is going to work real well. I'm sure it's going to work because I've done this a couple other times already. And by the way, any plane, you're always tempted to make planes with 30 second doublers and stuff. Later on, you have to put the doublers in. My suggestion is this is a good way to do it if you need to go back and retrofit something. Do it right away. This stuff cuts really nice. Now, I made it just a little bit oversized, and again, I'll just dress it on a belt sander till it's a press fit. I can turn it in, wedge it, and pop it in place so that I'm using the end grain in every dimension. I'm adding strength. If it's just free floating in there, it's not going to add a lot of strength. You make like an I beam out of it, really. It actually is an oversized dimension now. Now I can start to push it. I know I have to take off about a 64th now. But I want that to be that that snaps right into position. And i got to make each one individual because I want these to be a really nice tight fit. And end grain balsa is some nice material. I got this from George Spar, I believe. 
Even if uh, it might have been Ed Gallagher too. Even so, George Spar does have this. It's balsa core material. Oh, so yeah. Good. yeah, by the way, this makes excellent tank shim material, too, when you want to make tank shims that don't self-destruct and load up with oil. <laughs> be tight enough now. Now, just press it and play. You want it to be a press fit that it kind of yeah. sticks in there nice and tight? Yeah. And make sure it's tight all the way down to the back. You don't want... Because anywhere there's a gap here, what's going to happen, it's just going to fill up with epoxy. A nice, tight fit. See, that won't even come out. You're, That's that'll good. stay in there real nice. Okay, now just replicate the same thing on the other side. That's going to be fine. It's perfect, perfect fit. Yeah. Now mixing up the epoxy, I made up a flux brush taped to the end of a screwdriver so I can get way down inside the cowling while I'm working on it. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to mix this up. This is the West Systems resin, a little bit of cabosil to make it a little bit thicker so it'll get in all the corners and make a good structural bond. System, huh? Yeah, this is totally different. What this will do, this will fill in all the corners and edges and cracks and everything that's in there. It'll make it, in effect, it'll bond that piece of fiberglass right into the structure. Where if you just epoxy it and there's a, there's a gap, there's going to be a gap. This makes it a little thicker. It's almost thixotropic. What will happen even if even if you get a real lot of Now you cleaned all inside that tank out? Yeah. With M six hundred and everything? I okay. used I used the uh, at the uh, silkens. Okay. On the little Make this nice and thick. And just hold it on that side. The idea is to get the material into all the corners and edges. Right up against the motor mounts. Okay, we can go right to the back. Just hold it straight. We'll do one side at a time. I want to get the corners and edges. Otherwise, it's not pressing up on a motor mounts, and it's doing you less good. Having a nice long, nice long uh, probe here to get that in there. That long enough? Yeah, it's fine. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to paint the other piece too. A second. Here. And that's, uh, this is this side. Okay, I marked them. Shelf life, and this is what half an hour. Third yeah, half an hour. Yeah, sometimes it's a little it's cool here today, so it'll be a little longer. On a hot day it's it's fifteen minutes though. Now whatever comes off with this we can just get it swabbed out. The trick is get the edges, get the back. It's it nice and messy. Up here. Worse than mixing concrete. So okay, now hold it steady now. If your fingers to come adhere to that, we have to put your fingers in the, in the... That's right, you have to run around on a... Okay, now the way to get this probed in... I have to put you on the line, keep your separate set of lines. All right, hold it steady now. Nice. You see, it's such a tight fit, I'm going to have to force it. Okay. Hold it steady now. Okay. You can use it a prop. See it oozing out in all the corners and edges? That's what you want. That's what I want. Now we can get a Q-tip. Just hold it just the way it is. Right. We can get a Q-tip, tape it to the end, get all, anything that drools out on one side. If you don't have good integrity in this bond, it's, it's useless. Stuck up nice in position. Well, what I can do is, when I get the other one in, I'll make a little piece, a bulkhead doubler we can shove right in the back. That'll hold the back in place. And then we can just make a little piece up in the front. Okay, let me mix some of this up. Just hold steady. If nothing else, it's going to fuel proof the hell out of this area, too. <laughs> That's right. This will be the most fuel proof tank compartment in the world. All the corners and edges. Nothing was ever spilled in there. No, it looks pretty dry. Actually, it looks pretty decent. It's 
still have the spinner you painted with this uh, oh, oh. black. I haven't used it ever. Okay, hang on. Let's see if we can snap this one right in. Oh, oh what a fit! What a fit! It's done heaven, right? Oh, what a fit. Unbelievable. Ron Fair would be proud of you. <laughs> he did okay. say that you, you judged him fair, though. You see, the other guy didn't like him, whoever he was. I <laughs> said, so join the crowd. This little piece that I'm going to try to probe into the back and force it down in there to spread those two doublers nice and tight in position. Made a good pattern. I know I need to make this the, an eighth of an inch thicker so it'll actually add to the thickness of the bulkhead that goes right in front of the motor again all end grain balls it should be nice and light and really strong nice and tight now that piece is a really nice tight fit down there you're impressed right yeah. see now that'll act like a little a press Okay, that takes care of that. Okay, what we did, we have this piece, of course, in end grain balsa, permanently glued to the back of the tank where the former is. And this is just a spreader bar to make sure this is nice and tight, pressing out while these doublers dry. And we're going to give that an hour or so to dry before we put it back together. And then we'll clean up the mess. And what else do you want to do on this guy today? Is that it? That's it. Okay, he's ready to go for eight year old plane. I guess after eight years, you're allowed to do one or two little repairs, huh? Yeah. Still looks good, though. Oh, yeah, look at that. The way we want to check to make sure that epoxy is good and dry before we take it out. Of course, the exotherm and the, the epoxy, now you're not going to get that out. That's like a rock. You can't even totally touch that. But when it's spread in thinner layers, it's still cheesy. Yep. This has turned to cheese now. So we're just going to let this sit. Okay, I'll give it another half an hour and a half. Make sure that's that this part of it is good and good and rock hard before we go take the plane apart. Take that bulkhead out, put it together, and if we can get outside and run it. Balance the prop. We got the prop balanced. So I hope we're gonna be back to having a motor run here, one way or another. Okay, she's also got it hanging in the laundry room by a heating vent. You can see the heating yeah. vent here. Just, uh, hey, nice fireplace. Worked on that yesterday, too. That's coming along. We're going to be putting that up in the bedroom. Anyway, just to get this, that any epoxy that's still in there works its way down into the corners and seams, gets rock hard, and it'll be ready for a test. And, of course, nothing beats a real-world test, not just thinking about it and playing with it and looking at it. There's nothing more important than just, just do the test. We painted this spinner eight years ago, if I remember yes. right. Seven, eight years ago. Look, the paint job is still immaculate on it. I think that was black Imran. Right? And an eight-year-old cowling, yeah. I don't care what it is, it worked. I probably have the videotape of painting You do, out, out in your other place. Yeah, at the other house, yeah. Up on the rail, sitting on the railing, all drawing one afternoon. Right, right, I remember that. I probably got the tape. It dried up beautifully. Oh, that looks so nice. All right, let's get the tank. You got the shims? Got the shims. Let's get the tank, everything shims. back in there. Get it outside and let's get a bench run on it and see if uh, all this work was in vain. Okay. Moles will probably fly off and kill a cat or something. <laughs> let's get rid of these. <laughs> <laughs> max needle valve? I know I do. Okay, well, we'll change that. I don't like, I'd rather have a max needle we'll in there. Change right now, I'll send you one. No, there's no point. We, we just right. want to run it now. All right. and but if you always have a choice, OS Max, the ones that go in FSRs are the ones you want to have. See, this, this Second choice is an Enya. There aren't any, though. You got the other piece? Oh, you got the prop? Okay, we've rebalanced the prop. Aha, always a key thing. Nice and warm outside, too, Russ. It's only like <laughs> 30 degrees. All this time, this is one of the problems everybody always has. You go to tighten up the prop, and now the plane's been sitting, and it rubs on the back plate. The motor's in just a little bit different position. So we're going to make some sandpaper washes. 
This is an old 80 grit sanding belt from the shop. And this makes the best, the best. Oh, when they're like that. Is just drill a hole first. If you want to even drill it over on a drill press. Barbima. You need to gain a little prop space. Boy, that's worth its weight in gold. Put that on and you'll be in fat city there, my boy. All right. Get that little spacer in there. What a guy, I'll tell you. If I didn't know Russ, this is the world's longest put the motor back in a plane episode. What? It isn't getting any warmer out there either, you know. Windy, it's a wartime help. <laughs> ran this until the oil is coming out nice and clean this is a virtually a new motor you could wipe that off now right. that's that's the color cast the oil should be clean it all up then what we want to do is we want to take the fuel line off the motor fill the tank up or half fill it even right. and then put caps on all the vents and you're all set put that away for the winter and you're ready baby that's all she wrote see here. polish it up make it like new Let's see here what happened to my little wrench I got it in my pocket. Okay. You, you got a bolt in there now? Yep. We're, oh, no okay. leaking now. Yeah, otherwise otherwise what will happen is the fuel will be dripping out all winter. And how about here? Want to plug in here? No, nothing goes in there. No, you got it. Just just keep the top. Now the tank has fuel in it. It's all plugged up. Put the cowling back and you're ready to put it in a car whenever you're, you're looking at Fat City here, There's baby. Gildini There's Gildini on the old movies right there. Russ, you're ready to go, baby. I'm telling you. Yeah, I never get sick of watching this old footage. I'll tell you, you could watch this old stuff a million times. Who's flying there now? Lou McFarland. That's Lou McFarland flying? Yeah. yeah I saw this in real life. I Lou McFarland. I'm going to have bought them all after I saw this fleet. Flying lumber yard. What, what heavy? <laughs> flying ambroid yard, Everything okay. Is, is All right, detail that sucker up, put it on a car lot for sale. What do you think? 50 bucks. $50. I'll go 60. Just another day down at the shop. Another plane saved from the ravages of not having a motor run. Anyway, that modification worked real good and can't wait for some flying weather. It's not a flying day out there today. Back in the house for some warm coffee. See you on the next date. And it won't be long and we're going to be starting the soon, hopefully, to be I-Beam. Most awesome plane ever built in the creation of the British Empire. The Adamusko Otnowski Spitfire Seafire number three. Stay tuned.
Oh, I'll tell you, I never stop thinking about Spitfires. And they're coming. Good productive day.